Thank you, Evan. Um, first off, let me say, Yakima, thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Um, especially thank you to the Smith family. You know, um, I wish Jim was here. <laughs> um, 1989, I was 14 years old. Right? Never had no dealings with the law. Didn't know what Miranda was. I was just a 14 year old kid who really didn't know what he wanted to do in life yet. Just trying to figure it out. The only thing I did know was that every other day my dad used to come with VHS tapes and he had me pop them in because he wanted me to make some movies. Right? He had me double movies for him. So that was the relationship that we had. It was father and son type stuff. He used to do things. Um, you know, he never put pressure on me to pick a profession. What do you want to be? Do you want to be a lawyer, doctor? I was a 14 year old kid. I just liked to listen to hip hop music, sketching my pad, and that was it, just live life. And so, April 19th, it was a, a holiday weekend. I didn't have no school that day, well, that weekend. So, the morning to that weekend. So, usually my, my curfew was 9 o'clock, but on this night, I could stay out a little bit later. So, he gave me till 10. So how I'm going to utilize that, I had a couple of my friends I was with, and we were going to go to this party in the Schaumburg houses, because I was a 14-year-old kid that had some nice-looking girls over there who I wanted to see. <laughs> so that was the motivation. <clears throat> and as I got to the Schaumburg houses with my friends, there was a group of boys in front of the Schaumburg houses who I didn't know. But we had mutual friends within the group, so that's why I wound up being at the Schaumburg to begin with. Right? And it was on 110th Street, and Central Park was literally across the street. So this was their backyard to play in. This is where they hung out at. So as a 14-year-old kid who was a follower, when, I, you know, when the group moved into the entrance of Central Park, I just moved with them. Not understanding, not knowing. Never really been in Central Park. Because I lived in the Bronx, and then I moved into Harlem. I've been on the outskirts of Central Park, but never inside. So I didn't know my way around. So I was really at the mercy of the people I was with, right? <clears throat> and so walking into Central Park, it's a big group of boys. And we get hit with a flashlight, a, a spotlight from the police car. So everybody runs and scatters. So now I'm walking around with some guys who I don't know, trying to find the guys who I came with. And instead of walking out the park, I go in deeper, not knowing where I'm going. So, right? get to the reservoir right in Central Park and at that moment I see a man jogging at the reservoir and I see a kid run up on him and assault him and the kid named Jermaine Robinson right and so off of that everybody ran we all ran out the park and I wound up getting arrested and going into the precinct so initially I was charged with trespassing riot menacing these are all misdemeanor charges, and I was supposed to be given a disappearance to appear at family court. My dad was supposed to come and pick me up, right? But what we didn't know was that around one in the morning, these guys was walking through the park because they were cut from the east to the, from the west to the east, and they found this body in the ravine, right? She lost 85% of her blood. They didn't think that she was gonna make it. She was bound in gag, and she had all these injuries around the head and the eyes. And so, initially, they thought that this was going to be a homicide. They thought that she, she wasn't going to make it, so they called them the Homicide North Detective Squad, who was the elite of the police force. 20-plus years on the force, we were 14 and 15-year-old kids who never had no dealings with the law. So this playing field was unleveled from the get-go. So what happens is well, the parents come, some of the guys are getting, leaving out, right? And I'm waiting for my dad to come. And Kev, Kevin Richardson, who was also a guy who got arrested that night, who I didn't know, right? His sister came, and they had him in an interrogation room already. So I didn't know. I found this out later on. So I was supposed to leave with my dad, and automatically said, hold on, detectives want to talk to you. So we didn't know what it was, so we just hung around. We waited. So the detectives pulled me in the room, and it starts off very simple. Who were you with? What happened that night? Because we know there's a large, large group of kids, somebody got assaulted, but no, you know, what happened? So I tell the story of what I seen and who I was with. 
And then the detective says, wait a minute. What happened to the woman? And I say, what woman? I never saw a woman. And he says, the woman who was raped. And at that moment, it's, 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 like, a, it's like a movie moment where everything just stops. And it gets serious. This isn't a game anymore. And I'm saying, wait a minute. I don't know anything about a woman. So the questioning goes on. It's estimated that we're in these rooms for 15 to 30 hours under questioning, under intense pressure. But it doesn't start that way. It starts very easy. What happened? Who were you with? What did you see? And then when you don't get the answers, it becomes, wait a minute, you're holding something back. I told you everything. Uh, we think you're holding something. And at the time, my grandmother came. She, she came with my dad. So my dad wound up leaving, and my grandmother stayed. So she came in the room, and she spoke very little English. She just knew curse words in English. That was it. <laughs> All right? But she couldn't carry a full conversation. So the detective, who was by name of Detective Arroyo, he had to translate. So he would question me, then he would translate to her. And that process became too long. So they figured out how to speed it up. So what would happen is a detective would come and knock at the door. And he came in. He said, Miss Cologne, can I talk to you in the hallway? And she, because it was just moderate question. It wasn't with nothing too, too hectic. So she got up and walked out. And at that moment is when they started to work on me, me not knowing. So it starts off with one cop walking in. And he tells his part, he tells the royal. Is this the guy that did it? And the royal says, yeah, but he doesn't want to give up the information. He's being hard-headed. And so at this moment, the cop looks at me, and he curses at me. He says, I don't know if I can say that here. <laughs> but he says, what are you looking at? And at that moment, I'm just startled, right? So I just take it, I'm just looking. I don't say anything. And the knock comes. My grandmother comes back, and he walks back out. So the line of questions starts all over again. Who were you with? What did you see? And it's the same story until we get to this woman. Raymond, come on, now you're holding. And I'm like, no, I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you. So another knock comes at the door. One more time. This time a redhead detective comes in. And it's the same scenario. Is this the guy? Yeah, but he's being hard headed. He doesn't want to tell us. So he sits next to me. And he gets this close to my face. And he just starts talking. And he's saying some obscene things. You know you did it. You're going to go to jail. And at this point, I'm getting a little shaken, but because I, I really don't know what's going on. And at the same time, a lawyer is, they're both yelling at me. The knock comes back, my grandmother comes back in. So, still, she still doesn't understand. She doesn't see me eyes shaking. I'm okay, still maintaining it. And we start with the line of question all over again. Now, what am I describing here? This is CSI, right? The stuff that you see on CSI, Lord and Lord, the good cop, bad cop, this is what's being done to me. But I don't know. I'm 14 years old. So the line of question starts all over again. That goes on for several hours. Lastly, the knock comes at the door. The detective comes in. He takes my grandmother out. Right? But this time, it's a royal. A royal bangs on the table. He gets upset. You're going to give me what I want. And he reaches over. And at this point, I'm thinking they're going to kill me in this precinct. I'm not going to make it out of here. So now I'm shook. My grandmother comes, well, sorry. Now, um, when he, well, my, my, um, at this point, when a royal goes to reach for me, there's another detective in the back of the room who I don't know by the name of Detective Hardigan, who just sneaks into the room and he's sitting in the back. And he's the one that stops a royal, curses at him, escorts him to the door, kicks him out the room, slams the door, and then he starts his pitch. Raymond, I know you're a good kid. I know you didn't do this. I know you, can, you, know, you got a lot of girls probably, right? You don't have this problem. And I'm like, no, I don't. And he says, well, there's these kids in these precincts, and they're saying that you did it. And I'm sitting there saying, did what? Don't know. And he says, you got to help me. And I'm like, how? How do I help you? Mind you, I feel like this guy just saved my life. So I feel like I owe him. And he pulls out this picture of Kevin Richardson. He lays it on the table, on the desk, and he slides it to me. And he says, 
do you know this guy? And I said, no, I don't. He said, this is Kevin Richardson. We picked him up tonight also. You see the scratch under his eye? And I said, yeah. And he says, that came from the woman fighting him off. Now, he's going to prison. But I don't want you to go to prison. I need your help. So now I'm stuck. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. So I do what a typical 14-year-old kid does. He lies. Because at that point, I feel like I'm helpless. And there's nobody there to help me from this situation. And this is the guy who, 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 who stopped something. So I feel like I owe him. Right? So I blurt out, Kevin did it. And he says, Kevin did what? I said, Kevin raped the woman. He said, well, how? I don't know. Never seen this before. But I have to make it up as a 14-year-old kid. So what I say is I've seen Kevin wrestling with this woman, and he takes it down, and he's the only one that commits the assault. And he says, okay, but what about uh, Antron McCray? I don't know who Antron is. Well, we know he was there because he said something. He's in the prison right now talking about you. So he was there. We know he had a part of this. So I placed him at the scene. He says, what about Stephen Lopez, who got arrested that night? I don't know Stephen Lopez. And he says, come on, Raymond. This woman lost a lot of blood. She might not make it. Something had to be used. A rock, a brick, a pipe. He gave me the options. <laughs> Pick. And I said, a brick was used. He said, who used the brick? Since I didn't know what to do with Stephen Lopez, I gave him the brick. <laughs> yeah. So he wrote it all down. Right? And he says, okay, this is good. He said, but, eh, got to make it stick. What? What do we do? What was you doing? Me? I wasn't doing anything. I was just, I saw what happened. Eh, that's not believable, really. You got to be in the scene. You have to be there. And at that moment, he sat back and just let it linger. As a 14 kid, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to make it some type of lie that makes sense. So what I do, I try to pick the, mini, the smallest role. I said, oh, I leaned over, I reached over, and I grabbed the woman's breast. That's all I did. And he said, okay. He writes it down. He said, you did good. But I need you to do one more thing for me. And I say, what? He says, you're going to go to another precinct, you're going to tell the same story to the same detective, and you're going to do a video. And then after that, I'll make sure you can go home. And at this point, I feel relieved. I'm like, okay. But what just happened here? And so this whole time, I'm here lying, thinking they're going to figure it out. And so we go to the booking. They send us to, to the booking. And we go, we go through the system, and it's at that moment that you see when they see us, when we're all sitting in the bullpen. That happens really a little bit later, but that's part of it, where we all start to realize that we all went through the same process. They did it to all of us. And so now we're sitting there in this bullpen trying to figure out how do we get out of this situation. And for me as a 14-year-old kid, I'm just thinking, once they to me, I'm thinking the most trouble I'm in is that once they find out I lied, now my father's going to come in and say, you was lying, what's going on here? You telling the story? But they never came back. So you, you, you fast forward a couple of weeks into, I'm into, oh, sorry, you fast forward a couple of weeks into the case, right? Within the first two weeks of the case, there were over 400 articles written about us dissecting the lives of 14 and 15 year old kids. Talking about how we were trouble youth. Talking about how we was urban terrorists. Talking about how we was wolf pack. How we were super, super predators. Super predators is a terminology that was used to bring forth the 1994 crime bill that started mass incarceration. That was the label that was given to us in 1989. Donald Trump takes out $85,000 page ads calling for the death penalty for 14 and 15 year old kids in the local newspapers. And this is, we haven't even been indicted yet. So the scene is already set, right? And so, the whole time, we're thinking they're going to come back and they're going to say, hey, you guys lied. Why did you lie? And they never came back. So the detectives come in, they take handprints, they took footprints, they took hair samples, 
They took saliva, they took blood, they took pubic hairs, took everything, took our clothes, right? And then they went and they sent it to test it because they found a DNA sample, right, that was on the sock, and then also the job that had semen in her. So they knew, they knew that it was a culprit. And so they tested all that stuff and all of it came back with no matches. And it's at that point when it comes back with no matches that we say, now they're gonna come back and ask why did we lie? But guess what? They never came back. So in two and a half, you know, within 18 months, we were the first trial, we were charged, tried, and convicted. So as a 14-year-old kid, I'm sitting there saying, how do I get convicted of a crime that I didn't commit, and you know I didn't commit this, but because of a statement that sounds good, that stops off and says, approximately 1,700 hours, myself and 39 of my friends entered Central Park and we traveled southbound. What 14 year okay talks like that? <laughs> what we didn't understand was that the city was in financial crisis. They needed money. They was almost declaring bankruptcy, and they were trying to figure out how do they generate funds to come into, pour into the city. What we didn't know was that that super predator term was used deliberately because once we were convicted, they saw that they can get away with it. Those 300 articles that you, that you saw in that 6 o'clock news every night, because we were on the page news in the news every day for two and a half years. Two trials. How do you convict me off of this? How? How you do it is that you put out so much negative press on us that it makes a person who comes home at six o'clock at night from working a nice hard job and he wants to sit home and have dinner and talk to his wife and hug his kids and watch the six o'clock news and he sees a mugshot of me because I've just been in interrogation for 15 to 30 hours. And when he sees that mugshot, he says, yeah, he must be guilty of something because he looks crazy in that mugshot. <laughs> so the whole city turned his back on us. Everybody thought we was guilty. We got death threats. Some of our family members were assaulted in the street. They wanted to, they called for castration. Pat Buchanan put out an article that we need to be hung in Central Park and Corey needs to be horse whipped. This is what we was dealing with. William Kunstler, who represented Yusuf Salam, the late great William Kunstler, who represented Yusuf Salam, he said, Jesus Christ couldn't get you out of this. This train is moving at a tremendous speed and nobody's going to be able to stop it. You got to ride it out. And that's what we did. We figured, we tried to figure it out in prison. So we go to prison, spend the next seven years in prison, trying to figure it out, trying to adjust to prison life, trying to adapt to something that I didn't even ask to be a part of. I had no choice. The label of the Central Park Five was something that we didn't earn. They gave it to us, and we were stuck with it. And so, I don't know how much time, 13 years later, most of the fellas are back out in the streets. Nobody was able to go to the parole board and get granted parole. They, we all got released on conditional release dates. I was so institutionalized that I went back and forth to prison. I didn't know how to function in society. There was no transitional programs. There was no halfway house. There was no work release for me. I was the first one that was released out of the five. It was hard to have a, a relationship. And if I tried, I, I filled out numerous applications and they all said, because you know that little box back then that said, have you ever been convicted of a crime? You got to check yes. What's the charge? Rape in the first, no job. And if somebody said, you know what, I'll give you a shot. you like a good guy. Well, what, what you go to jail for? The Central Park job in Cape. I'll see you later. There is no job. The five to 10 year sentence that I was given wasn't a prison sentence. It was a death sentence. It was, they, they gave us a social death. We weren't supposed to make it out of prison, and then we weren't supposed to survive in society. 
Everybody was supposed to turn their backs on us. And, and to an extent, that's what they did. Until one day, Corley's in his 14th year in prison. Can't make parole board. He, has any, he doesn't even want to go to parole board. He wants to max out because he's seen the, the problems that we're having in the streets. So he stays in prison. And him walking the yard, spinning the yard, this guy walks up to him. Says, hey, you was in C-74, right? Design in 1989. So yeah, he said, we're in the same house with you. You remember me? We, they had a fight over the TV on Wright Island in, 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 in the jail in 1989. Corby has a scar right here on his eye from it. And so he says, well, you've been locked up all this time? And Corby says, yes. And he says, wow, you know, and, and they just had this conversation. And in this conversation, the guy tells Corby, you know, I'm finding Jesus Christ. My life is a little, you know, it's a little different now. I go to church on Sundays. And so, he never told Corey that he was the perpetrator of the crime. He just, you know, he tested, what we call it, we call it um, testing, the, uh, testing your energy. See, see what comes back from it. Testing the water to see how Corey was going to respond. And he saw that Corey was still humble. He saw Corey walk, he had bad feet. His feet was messed up from all the years of wearing them state boots. And so, this guy went back to his cell and he sat on that, and it bothered him. And he sat and spoke to other inmates, and he said, you know what, I got to do the right thing. And so he started to tell the story about how he was the sole perpetrator who raped the Central Park jogger in 1989, right? And so this guy go, goes on to the pastor, the warden, and he keeps telling the story until he gets to central office in Albany, and they send somebody to interview him and talk to him. And we also send somebody to talk to him at the same time, but we get there first. So we get an affidavit, he tells his story of how he's the person and, that, who raped and, and, and left the jogger for dead. His name is Mateus Reyes. What we find out is that he's known as the East Side Rapist, the East Side Slasher. The summer of 1989, he raped four women and he murdered a pregnant woman in the house while her kids were in the next room. So this guy was telling the story and he's saying that he's the sole perpetrator and the city is trying to connect him to us. They try to make him the sixth man. To the point that Mateus Reyes gets so frustrated that he says, I'm tired of talking to you guys. If you're not going to do the right thing, then I'm done here. So to prove our innocence, we had to go through an eight-month process, an eighth-month investigation. And in that investigation, we find out that the police department, in their notes, are trying to connect us to Reyes and make him the sixth man. We find out in their notes that, um, that, uh, uh, um, that the same homicide North detective squad back then one of the same members from back then was on the new Homicide North Detective Squad, and he was the one that was trying to lead the investigation into us. So this was a whole setup. It was a whole setup. And so ultimately, the district attorney says, you know what? No, backtrack. They talked to Reyes again. And Reyes says, you know what? I'm going to tell you how real this is. I'm going to give you four unsolved cases that you didn't know I did. And that's what he gave them. They went and reinvestigated those cases and found out he was the perpetrator. His MO, all his victims had the same injuries around the head and the eyes, and they were all bound and gagged, just like the jogger. So they couldn't ID him. So there's a 52-page report by this district attorney by the name of Nancy Ryan. You can Google it and look it up. It's about 51 pages. You can read it yourself. And the district attorney says in that report, with all this evidence, we're still trying to understand how did these guys get convicted in the first place? Because it was a bigger scheme there. It was a bigger scheme there. We were the scapegoats for the city. We were the scapegoats. We became the poster children because now 
it was time to round up our kids and send them to prison. Because later on, we found out that if you house a man in New York State Correction, uh, New York State Correction Facility, it costs about 40000 per year, roughly. But as you house a juvenile, it was upwards of 200000 per year. So that's bigger budget money. So they played with our lives for budget money and left us there to pick up the pieces. Wow. Wow. How do you come back from that? How do you find your voice from that? We were 14 year old kids and they left us there as broken pieces to fix ourselves and to figure it out. And that's what we had to do. And so after exoneration, we thought things would get better. Things would be easier, right? The city said, hey, we know that there was a wrong done. We're gonna give you some money, settle you out so you can go live your life. And then they offered us 2.1 million for the five of us. And they said, doesn't that, we're trying to do our part, doesn't that look good? And so the lawyer said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna file a lawsuit on a federal level. And I said, why on the federal level? And he said, because when we file on the federal level, now the city can't hold documents because they were stalling us. The city can't, they had to overturn everything. So now we can dissect this case and we can pinpoint the exact moment when the prosecutors knew you were innocent and they put together the plan on how to convict you. And they never thought we were gonna find that out. There's a book by, the name, by a guy named Harrod Le Le Levy. It's called The Blood That Cried. It's a DNA book. In, the, in that book, there's a chapter on us. And in that book, in that chapter, this guy, who worked in the DA's office, he worked with Elizabeth Letterer during our case. And when that DNA evidence, I'm not sure they see those handprints and the footprints and the hair samples and the blood samples and they tested it and nothing matched, he describes that exact moment when she gets the results. And she says, I feel like I've been kicked in my stomach because none of this stuff matches. So what are we supposed to do at this moment? Reinvestigate. But she said, no. How do we make this fit? And she went to, she went to Linda Festi, who was the head of sex crimes at the time, and they both conspired and said, how do we make this fit? And they came up with a plan. So they separated us. The first trial was me, Yusuf, and, and Antron. That's how they did it. And so we was able to un uncover all that stuff, right? So we'd say, okay, now we need litigation. We can win this one. But they had another plan. They decided to stall us. So it took us 11 years to get through litigation and get a settlement. And we only got the settlement because what we did was we put a lot of pressure on people who were running for office. We were able to get in front of the top four mayoral candidates in New York City at the time. Do you support the Central Park Five? Yes, I do, okay. Let's take a photo. But we had one thing we didn't know about Bill de Blasio, who ultimately was the person who settled the case. What was that? Not question yet, I'm still talking. <laughs> so this is how it was. This, everything that we got, we earned, we fought for it. We fought for it. And so we're thinking it's over. It's, it's not over. Because what happens is that in that 11-year in that process, that litigation that we're trying to fight, right, and nobody's really helping us the way that we need help, we get a blessing. A young girl by the name of Sarah Burns, who, eight, who was eight years old in 1989, is working at my lawyer's office. And she starts to do research on the case because she wants to write a paper on us. She asks, can she write one? And in the process, she uncovers the truth. And so she wanted to do something. Now she wanted to be engaged. She wanted to help. So she said, I got an idea. Let's write a book. So she wrote a book. It's called The Century Park Five, A Case of a City Wilding. And so at that point, nobody else was writing a book, so we had nothing to lose. And so in the process of her writing this book, her dad was editing the chapters. And her dad saw it for herself, 
And he said, wow, these guys are innocent. I thought they were guilty. And she said, no, Dad, they're innocent. And he said, I would love to meet them. This is a film. We can do a doc on this. So she came to me and she said, hey, my dad wants to do a film on you guys. And I said, who's your dad? And she said, Ken Burns. <laughs> yeah. And my response was, who's Ken Burns? <laughs> so they gave me a film on baseball. They gave me a film on Jack Johnson. And I said, oh, this is Ken Burns. And so we do the film. Nobody really wants to do the film in the beginning because we're still under litigation. Everybody's afraid to tell their story. And I tell my lawyer, I say, you know what, we have to do this. In order to make some type of headway in this case, because the city is stalling us, you know, at this time, you know, it's been years. This is a no-pay case. Mayor Bloomberg is in office at the time. He said this is a no-pay case, because what we found out later on was that Mayor Bloomberg worked at Solomon Brothers. He got fired from there. They gave him a nice severance package of $10 million. But the job also worked at Solomon Brothers. So this was a no-pay case. He wasn't settling anything. <laughs> Ain't that something? Every corner we turn, there's an obstacle. There's an obstacle. But what Ken Burns did do for us, though, he leveled the playing field. Because once Ken Burns found, knew that we was innocent, he stood on that. And when he went to his funders and his donors, and he said, hey, my next film is on the Central Park Five, they all said no. It's a New York story. We're not going to fund that. And so we thought Ken Brown was going to be discouraged. Mm -mm. Turned them up even more. Because now he was excited. Oh, they don't want to fund me? We're going to do it another way. Watch this. And we get the film done. And literally, that changes the scope. It also starts to give us our voice back. Because now we have to promote the film with Ken Burns. And if you know Ken Burns, wow. I was the first person that gave the interview. My interview was two and a half, two and a half hours long. And me and Ken Burns did a lot of traveling together in the beginning. We became like family. And so Ken Burns got me in a lot of rooms that I couldn't get in. And I told my story. We showed the movie. And we started to make some headway. But it gave us our voices back. It gave us a platform to stand on. It gave us a reason to fight. And so then we get to settlement. Settlement is done. And everybody says, OK, now you got this money. You can go live your life. Like Yusuf says, you can go sit on the beach and sit my ties. But that's not us. It's different now. At this point, you know, 20 plus years under the belt, you turn me into a fighter. I can't just sit down. I can't. It doesn't work for me. I won't sleep good at night. So, so we continue to use our voice. We continue to get on the platform. But what happened was, when we started to talk, we, who are we talking to? And I said, for me, eh, I don't want to talk to my group because my group is the group that turned their back on me. So who do I go after? Who do I talk to? Who is the city trying to take from us? Our children. Because they want our children to occupy a jail cell in the college dorm. It's all about statistics. It's all about numbers. It's all about budgets. And so I said, we have a duty to tell these kids that there's a pitfall that's waiting for them. The system is ready to grab you, make you a negative statistic. But hopefully I can, I can, I can save you. And that became the calling. And so we started doing that, going around, city, country, city to city, state to state, talking, telling our story. And, and, and in doing that, we became empowered. And so it wasn't enough. We got to do more. We got to get a bigger platform. And so here it is that one day I go to see Selma the movie Selma, and I'm watching this scene where Coretta is, front, is confronting Dr. King about infidelity. I spoke about this this morning. And I sat there and I watched it and I was, I was upset.
because when I watched this movie and I, and I saw that scene, this was one of our iconic figures. And now you're saying that he has, you know, he, he, um, he, he, he has faults. I didn't like that. And so I looked around the room and there was spots of colored people in the audience. It's 85% white people in the audience that was watching this film. So I was really upset because now you put them in this light. So I went home that night and I did my research and I said, who directed this film? And it was a woman by the name of Ava DuVernay, woman of color. Then I looked at the picture and she had like dreads and locks and I was like, oh, disrespectful. <laughs> but then I sat and I said, you know what? This might be what we need. And so the goal was to get Ava. And so at the time, social media is big. It starts to get big at this point, right? I'm on Twitter, and the handle on there is called the Central Park Five. And so I follow Ava. She winds up following me back. Then after that, I wind up putting out the tweet, and they said, what's going to be your next film? Hopefully, see Central Park Five. And I had all these hashtags underneath it, tried to dress it up. And then she retweeted it. So when she retweeted it, I said, ooh, I got her. She's interested. And then she DM'd me. She sent me a direct message. And she said, well, who has the right to your story? And I said, nobody. Waiting on you. And she comes to New York City. We sat for about maybe two hours. And at that moment, this was my moment. I needed to lay it all on the line. Tell her everything. And that's what I did. And then we decided, she decided to do the film. And so when we get to, from, from, so from the Ken Burns doc, where we find our voices and we become fighters to the Ava DuVernay piece of when they see us, we're telling everything now. We're not going to hold nothing back. Because at the end of the day, it's about the children. And we need them to see what happened to us. Because we don't want it to happen to them. So that's what it was, that was at stake. So when I come here, right, so when I get the call <laughs> and they say, hey, you're going to go to Yakima, <laughs> where's Yakima? <laughs> they said, oh, Seattle. And I was like, where's Yakima? <laughs> but it's a calling because I never heard of the place, so I said, I need to go. Because I need to see what's going on there. Right? Now we're here to spread the message. Now we're here to touch the youth. We're here to tell them the story of what happened to us. We're here to spark, hopefully, that thought that can make change for tomorrow. So you got to put your life on the line for that. Because it's for the betterment of everyone. Right? When it comes to the system, yeah, it starts out with black and Latinos, but when they use that commodity of what's next, it's all about a body because it's all about budgets. And if you look at the criminal justice system as a whole, everything that's attached to it is in the billions of dollars when it comes to budgets. Corrections, courts, prisons, social services, everything. So this is a system, and I always use New, I always use New York because that's where I'm from. So this is a system that can generate billions of dollars annually, can keep millions of people employed on the backs of 75,000 inmates. Wow. Who thought of that business plan? So at the end of the day, when I come here, and I got to say, first I got to say thank you because from the moment I got off the plane. It's been a warm embrace. So I knew I was at the right place. I knew I was here to do the right thing. And I was here to meet the right people. So I knew instantly, once I met Jim, I said, this is going to be a good experience. <laughs> you know? And so that's the goal. It isn't rocket science. We encourage 
you to go after those positions. We say occupy all spaces. And, we, and this message we tell to the kids. Occupy all spaces. That means if you want to be chief of police, you go get it. You want to be the prosecutor, you go get that position. The only thing we ask you to do is don't compromise that. Don't change policies, procedures to, 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 to benefit you. Make it benefit the community. This is how you do your part. So don't run from those positions. You take those positions, but you do them right and you do them effectively so that at the end of the day, it benefits your community as a whole. Because at the end of the day, it's a complex problem and it has multiple ways to fight it. So if I'm fighting from one, one angle, I expect you to come from a different angle and fight it because this is how the beast is made. And no idea is bigger. I'm here today, tomorrow it could be you I'm standing up here talking. Because it's all hands on deck. And whatever your medium is, I had a student the other day who said, you know, I don't know what to do, but I write music. And I said, well, that's what you do. You put your message in the music. Whatever your medium is, you use it. Right? That's what my answer said. You dance it. You walk it. You sing it. You write it. But you never give up and you never stop doing that. You keep doing it. You find your purpose in that. And you push it to the limit. Because you never know who you're going to save in that process. So I say that it was an honor to be here with you. Because I see the community. And I see it coming together. And I see promise. So thank you for bringing me here. Because now when I go back, I can talk about Yakima. <laughs> I was there. I see what's going on. I see the outcome. I see the people coming out. I see the interest. So I don't mind coming back to help out. You know, that's what it's about. But enough about me. I know you guys got questions. Thank you. I mean, I could talk all day, but I know that people have questions, so that's why I say, you know what, let's bring them in and engage as community. <laughs> oh, Thank you very much for being here. It was great to listen to you speak earlier. So when we talk about these things and what occurred and what happened, I can see that happening to me when I was a teenager because, again, parents limited English, don't understand the system. You know, luckily, um, my parents didn't have this issue, but you might be undocumented, so there's a bigger thing with the legal system. So I resonate deeply with it. But I think with a lot of people in, say, a normal Rotary Club, you know, they do have a different sense of privilege that it's just, oh, just call a lawyer. You just know your rights. You just know your things. So how, what role do you see those people and those adults, or even me as an adult, um, take part of the solution of what happened to you, but also that's happening thousands and tens of thousands of times across the country. Yeah, I think for me, you know, we, we tell the story because we want you to use it as a medium, right? We want you to tell the story of what happened to us. Because, like you stated, it can happen to anybody. And, it can, and it's still happening to this day, right? It's all about the awareness. When somebody know, when you know better, you do better. So all we can do is bring it to you. What you do with it, it's on you. Right? Because we know and understand that there are a lot of people who don't want to do anything. And you can't force them to do it. So you can't concentrate on them. You've got to concentrate on those who continue to do the work. And if they recognize it, hopefully it's not too late for them to jump on board. You know, I did this thing the other day on Instagram where um, I called it the, uh, my rant. Right? And, and that's what my rant was about. At the end, the conclusion was, well, you know what? I ain't got to help you. There's somebody else who needs my help. So why am I sitting here bickering with you or trying to get you to support me when that person is losing out? 
right? Sometimes we look at them as distractions. So you got to continue to do your work. And hopefully when that, that, sh that light shines bright enough, right? Because when it does shine bright, it, it, it brings attraction. People can't, they got to look. What are you doing over there? What's going on? You know, so you got to get clever in your approach also. But you got to continue to do the work for you, and hopefully they'll join in. You know, you can't force people to, that's like, you know, me telling Trump, hey, we need you over. That's not going to happen. <laughs> that's not going to happen. Yes. I'm grateful. Thank you. You spoke of uh, calling. And I want to go back to 2019 when you guys sat on the stage in that, that Oprah. Event. Yes. And on both sides of you on that stage was this terribly raw trauma that existed even then and this sense of loss. You could see it in them. I'm yeah. sure it was in you too. And a lot of time had passed since that original trauma. And I, I wanted to ask you, are you guys more okay now? But I realize that's not the right question. My, my question to you is, do the five of you have the opportunity and the ability to see rooms like this and rooms like all over the country, see the systemic change that are, are being made in the, the projects that, um, that Corey has undertaken and all of the, the good that is happening so that you can, you can take that and feel more okay because of what you're doing. Yeah, it, it's, it's, when I sit, sit on this stage, it becomes part of the healing process for me, right? So this is like a therapy session right now. <laughs> you know, because that's how I'm able to cope, right? I'm literally here telling you my story. I'm getting it out, and it makes me feel better afterwards. And so that's, you know, that's part of the blessing that, you know, that most of us have been able. Me, me and Yusuf did a lot of speaking. Right, I started public speaking around 2004. Yusuf started right after me. Then Kev joined in. And Corey joins in whenever he wants. Right? But that's the brotherhood. Right? That's the brotherhood that we have. This, 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 this circle that nobody asked to be in, but now we're stuck with it forever. Right? And so, you know, for us, it, it, it's, it's a blessing. Because now we have each other to, re to lean on and, and, and for, for extra strength. But in doing the work, you know, you, me and Yusuf, we go all across the country and do this. You know, because for me, I, I love to go to places that they need, they, need, they need me to come to. Yeah, we're not afraid. I uh, had the privilege of walking with a lot of folks in search of restoration who've been through immense trauma. Uh, much of it in their childhood where they could do nothing you know, to protect themselves. And, um, you have you know, been through a lot. Right? How have you stewarded your heart in order to become a person who, you know, who can hold hope you know, instead of just instead of just being hurt or other things? Yeah. Which would be totally ashamed, right? Yeah. You know? So, um, you know, if you were sitting with my friends, you know, been through, just, I mean, been pimped by the parents, all kinds of stuff, right? Like, how, what would you tell them to do with their hearts in search of restoration? For me, it, it, it's, it's, it's still difficult at times for me because here it is, the joy that I get of talking to the young people and giving the message, right? And then there's this other part of me, um, I spoke about this this morning, um, whereas in this whole process I became a fighter against the system and then what happens when the, the war is over or the battle is over you know like a boxer right you know, 12 rounds now the fight is over what do you do or you retire and for me um, I struggle with that because you built me up to be a fighter against the system and then once we declare that we win then you want me to just sit down and just go away. And I can't. So for me, it was also I had to channel that energy and say, where do I channel it at? Because I can't, Yusuf says, is, you know, you can't be bitter because 
if you bitter and you, you keep that inside, it will eat you from within. And so I said I had to channel it. But where do I channel it? Because on one end, I still have a system that still says we're guilty to this day. Police officers and certain prosecutors are still saying we're guilty to this day. So that becomes the, 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 you know, how do I balance it? And so for me, it was about challenging my energy into speaking to the kids. And that was the direction that we went in. So that was my method of how I was able to cope with it. Not wanting it to eat me from within and not wanting to be bitter, you know, because I had family members who turned their back on me. They thought I was guilty, you know. And then when they came back and apologized, I had to accept those apologies, but not for them, for me. I forgive you, but I won't forget. So I got to keep focusing on the message. Hey. I'm right over here. Oh. Hi, my Hi. name is Mirna. Thank you for being here. And uh, I just want to say that I really truly resonated with you when you said that what empowers you, what motivates you, are the children, are our youth our youth that is here because, and, and I mean, you, you lived it, you lived what I'm about to say. In the United States, the prison system decides how many prisons needs to be built by the time they see how many children do not read by the third grade. Mm -hmm. And so our, um, in, to hear you say, you do this, for the children just touched deeply my heart because you're answering to this terrific need that we have to say to our children, there are different pathways. We don't want you in the hole, right? Yeah. So thank you very much and blessings on your journey. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Uh, you, you speak fantastic. People follow your message. They resonate with you. They, they want to hear what you have to say. And uh, 10 years of, of public speaking, it, it's showing, my friends. Uh, my question is simple. Do you have political aspirations to spread your message even further? You said political aspirations? Oh, my God. So, <laughs> so you know, Yusuf has become city council member in New York City, right? And, and so... They asked me if I had those aspirations, and I said at the time, I said no. I said no, you know, the settlement just came. I need to situate myself. I need to, you know, get my life together. And so Yusuf, he winds up running, right? And, and, and so he runs in District, district nine, 8 and 9 in Harlem, and the Democratic Party didn't support him, right, at all. They laughed at him. They talked about him. They said, he's not a politician. He said, I never was. They said, um, you know, we don't even have a millionaire running for office. But what happened was, Yusuf went out there every day for six months, and he talked to the people. And when the people found out he was running, they responded. Literally, the whole Democratic Party went against Yusuf. And he won the district, I think, with 71%. So... So you know what happens next, right? They go, Raymond, are you? And I go, oh. <laughs> Yusuf has been in there, just got in 30 days. Let him get settled. But what happened? Yusuf gets stopped by the police, by the NYPD, with his wife and his children in the back seat. And so we didn't question the stop. We questioned why you didn't explain the stop. So Yusuf just got in 30 days, and we already got controversy. And you ask him, am I going to run for office? <laughs> it doesn't look promising by the way Yusuf is going right now. So I don't know. I leave it in God's hands, and whatever he tells me to do is what he's going to tell me to do. And that's how I basically live my life. God, what are we doing? Not day to day, but what are we doing? So that's why when he says, you're going to Yakima, all right, we're going. Yeah. So I'm not sure yet. I don't know. <laughs> Continue moment, you're gone. Thank you. So 
So could you, you talk about your platform? What do you want to know about my platform? The, name, the website that, that you have created. Oh, parkmadisonnyc.com? Oh, well, you've seen that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so after the settlement, right, I, I have a good friend of mine by the name of Rashid, Rashid Young, and, you know, we're just kicking around conversations, and he says, um, so you got the settlement now. You can go live your life. You don't got to do anything. What do you want to do? And I said, um, I want to build a T-shirt company. And he said, what do you mean a t-shirt company? Crazy? And I said, well, you don't understand. I went to jail at the age of 14 years old. Like I told you earlier, right? I like hip-hop music, and I used to sketch in my sketchbook all the time. And so I said, throughout the years, I struggled with that because I lost that passion in prison. And so sometimes it would resurface, and I would go on my sketch pad and do some drawings or some garments and stuff. And then I would just toss it because I didn't want to do it anymore. And I said, you know what? I want to give it one, one more shot. One more shot. And he said, all right, well, I can show you how to do it. And so we built Park Madison NYC. And it started out as just a t-shirt company, sweaters, hats. And then when When They See Us comes out, before it comes out, you know, I'm talking to Ava, and I designed, most, I designed, I designed mostly everything on the site. All the garments on there, I designed them. And so I'm sitting in my house one day, and I just had this idea, and I designed the Brotherhood T-shirt, right? And um, I call Ava. I'm so hyped. I said, I'm going to send you these, these drawings I just did. Tell me what you think. And so I sent the two pieces. One was the Tribute shirt, and the other one was the Brotherhood. And she said, well, the Tribute is okay. It's a little, little, little sketchy. But the Brotherhood, that's a winner. And she said, well, how many shirts you printed up? I said, about 1,000. She said, no, you need to print about 5,000. I said, Ava, you crazy. Not uh, 5,000. And she said, yeah. I said, no, I didn't listen. I didn't listen. I printed up 1,000 shirts. The moment when they see us drop that morning, I had the shirts on the site. And within maybe an hour, two hours, that thousand was gone. I had a woman call me and say, I need, I need 500 shirts. <laughs> and that was it. But the platform, and so it, it took a change, right? So it took a change because of the demand of the people. So we started, I started to sketch, I have voting t-shirts on there. Um, the Occupy All Spaces t-shirt was a tribute to Black Lives Matter. Um, currently, we have, right now, we have um, Drafted by God. Right? I, I created Drafted by God because I was sitting during the pandemic. What are we going to do? God, what are we doing? God said, just hold on, I got some things for you. But in the, in the process, do this. And I designed Drafted by God because Drafted by God, for me, was a calling. I'm drafted into the army for God. This is the work that I'm doing for him, to go talk to the kids, you know? And so that's how the platform was created. But it started with me chasing the dream that I thought I lost, and then I regained it, you know? And so it's been, it's been, it's been yeah. The Brotherhood T-shirt has, has been global. It popped up in South Africa, popped up in um, uh, Brazil, um, it popped up so many places. Like people would send us DMs and send us pictures, because that's one thing I asked about in these places. I say, if you got a t-shirt, take a picture and send it to me. And so now we have pictures coming from all around the world, which was awesome. So to me, it was just a testament of us going in the right direction, of us utilizing those mediums, you know? Yeah. yeah. I'm impressed with your uh, passion for youth. And I'd like to know what you would recommend the community of Yakima do for our youth that we may not be doing now. I would say just invest in them. At the end of the day, the kids is the commodity. The system is trying to get them to occupy a space. We're trying to get them to be productive. So you invest in them. You know, I heard that you guys have juvenile facilities here, right? And, and so you got to take an added interest in those, in those youths because how do you want them to return? Do you want them to come back and be a smarter criminal? 
or do you want them to be come back come back and be productive members of society? You have to build some type of um, transitional platform for them because I didn't have that. You know, and that's how you start to lay the foundation for them to become productive. You invest in them. You invest in them and you show them that you care as a community, that they're not alone, that they're not isolated, because you never know what a person's going through, especially as a kid, right? Nobody never asks us those questions. We didn't get those questions until we was well in our 30s, you know? And so for me, it was like, I had a daughter. And so when I had my daughter, that was my interest. And so it was like, hey, if I invest my time and my effort and my, and my mediums into those kids, at some point, I'm gonna plant a seed Maybe 20 years down the line, my daughter might be in need of help. And somebody will say, you know what? I met your dad. So whatever you need, and vice versa, right? That's part of community. So you take an added interest in, in the kids because they are your future, the future leaders of tomorrow, whether we like it or not, <laughs> right? That's, yeah. <laughs>